The moose, this absolute unit of a creature, is Mother Nature's behemoth of the cervidae or deer family. So as per usual, let's start off with the name. The scientific name for a moose is Elsa's Elsa's. Now based on how the plural of goose is geese, surely the plural of moose would be meese, right? Ha ha ha. No, that would be too easy. Instead, the plural of moose is just moose. Which just gives us another reason to hate the absolute garbage of a language known as English. Anyways, a group of moose is called a herd. A herd of moose isn't something you see that often since moose are rather solitary creatures. Which is a good thing for us. Just imagine a battalion of tanks charging at you and you'll have a vague sense of why we should be glad moose don't unite. Anyways, a male moose is called a bull and a female moose is called a cow. Which is just more weird English nonsense that I won't bother getting angry at. Europeans, however, call moose elk, despite elks being an entirely different species. Apparently they do this because moose and elk belong to the same family and just went, what the hey, they're close enough, let's just generalize them as one species. Which just seems kind of lazy even by my standards. Also, baby moose are called calves, so now you know. The word moose actually stems from Algonquian origins, being a derivative of the word moosu or moosh meaning something along the lines of bark stripper or eater of twigs. It's not exactly clear what the exact definition is, but it has something to do with stripping. Which brings us to the topic of a moose's diet. Thankfully, moose are herbivores. Due to how tall moose are, they have a hard time bending down to eat grass, so they end up eating mostly leaves, twigs, grouse, bark, just chewing on wood basically. And as one would imagine, Wood doesn't exactly have much nutritional value, so they eat from multiple species of plants and trees to make up for any nutrients they're lacking in. Which basically makes the moose gardeners that help mold forest growth by maintaining plant populations. But even then, moose still don't get enough nutrients sometimes, with one of the most important nutrients being sodium. Moose fulfill their sodium needs by munching on aquatic plants in ponds and streams that are rich in sodium. And in order to reach those aquatic plants, moose will go diving. And to this I ask, why? Why do you have to terrorize the waters too? Just imagine going snorkeling and then suddenly seeing a dark mass hurtling at you. But rather than a shark, it's a moose charging at you with murderous intent. Anyways, moose can stay up to 50 seconds underwater while feeding. The bulbous noses of a moose allows them to eat and swallow food underwater without having to return to the surface. And their nostrils were also closed to prevent water from entering their lungs. Salt is another important nutrient for moose since large amounts of salt are required for them to retain water. Moose usually get their fear of salt from salt licks, which are naturally occurring deposits of salt that moose can just lick. But in certain areas like Maine, salt licks are rather rare, which is why you might sometimes see moose on the sides of roads licking the salt runoff as an artificial salt lick. And much like cows, moose also have four chambered stomachs, meaning they barf up and re-ingest their food multiple times, with the first stomach fermenting the food and the other three extracting the nutrients. And with how massive moose are, they have an equally large appetite, needing roughly 10,000 calories a day to maintain their body weight. That's about five times more than the average human being, or half as much as the average American, with moose also being able to consume up to around 70 pounds of food a day in the summer and 30 pounds in the winter. For reference, a 3 year old human is about 30 pounds, so just picture a moose eating 2 toddlers a day and you'll have an idea of just how much 70 pounds is. Also moose can store more than 100 pounds of food in its stomach, which is about as heavy as a 13 year old. And as one would expect, they drink an equally copious amount of water, anywhere between 2 to 6 gallons a day depending on the season. During the winters, when lakes and ponds freeze over, moose aren't hindered by the ice at all. They simply break the ice with a powerful strike from their hooves, drink some water and mosey onwards. And now for some info about moose behaviors, preferences, and physical capabilities. Bows and cows are generally lived in the same environment until summer comes around, with those environments typically being boreal forests or taigas, if you don't know what these biomes are, just think Canada and you'll know. Anyways, once summer rolls around, bulls will seek cooler temperatures that are usually at high altitudes, where there's less food but more shading. And cows will stay in lower altitudes where there's denser food sources, making food easy to find for calves, therefore allowing them to spend less time eating and decreasing the time they're vulnerable to predators. 
Moose are also diurnal animals, being active mostly during twilight and dawn. You might see moose at night sometimes because of their weird sleep patterns, where they periodically wake up and fall back asleep throughout the night. Moose are also fairly peaceful animals that only get aggressive when threatened by predators, upon which they become the literal incarnations of wrasse, which segues us into moose predators that mainly consist of bears, wolverines, cougars, and wolves. Wolverines are opportunistic predators that wait until they find a weakened moose or an unattended calf and most bear species target cows or calves during calving season, the period where cows give birth to cows. Grizzly bears on the other hand rely heavily on moose as a food source, and can kill healthy adult moose during food scarcity periods, since they're specialized to hunt moose. Other bear species usually avoid confrontations with moose, while in any bear versus moose scenario, the bear will usually win. However, most of the fights will end with fatal injuries for the bear, so they tend to not want that smoke. As for wolves, they have a more complex relationship with moose, where the wolves rely on moose as their primary food source while also keeping the moose population in check, with wolves using their main strategy of hunting in packs while slowly rearing and tearing their prey apart. And cougars only really go after calves, which becomes super risky for them when there's a protective monster nearby defending the calf. Moose usually deal with predators by escaping at high speeds, which costs them fairly little energy thanks to their size and power, but rapidly drains the pursuing predator of their stamina. When moose do confront and fight their predators, they usually do so after choosing optimal fighting grounds for themselves, choosing terrain that hinders the predator's movements, such as shallow waters, or places that help protect their vulnerabilities. Once they do gain the high ground, they will go full Chuck Norris on you launching a flurry of bone-shattering, omnidirectional kicks, thanks to your front hooves being capable of striking in any direction, with some of those kicks even being capable of flat-out instant-killing predators. Wounding a moose just ends up enraging it, further amplifying their animosity, which is why in certain regions people fear moose more than bears, and justifiably so. Have you ever watched a moose fight? It's literally a clash of titans, and having one of these titans enraged at you will put the fear of god into you. And as usual, humans are another predator. While human encounters with moose are rare, when they do happen, moose tend to be violent towards humans by default. Most cases of moose violence are because of man's best friend, the dog, resembling wolves, but other cases are probably just because humans aren't that likable. In some bizarre cases, moose can even face predation by orcas when swimming between islands of the northwest coast of North America which was something that was only discovered after several instances of moose carcasses being found inside orcas. With as many predators as a moose has, their solitary lifestyles help reduce the chances of predation, which may seem counterproductive to you since a herd of moose would surely deter any predators. Well, just remember that they eat about two toddlers a day, and you'll understand why traveling in herds is impractical. As for the biological structure of a moose, well, moose are built like goddamn tanks. With the average moose being about 9 feet long, growing anywhere between 1.4 meters to over 2 meters tall, weighing about 0.75 tons on average, and having hooves 4 to 5 inches in width. The largest moose ever recorded was an Alaskan moose weighing 1,808 pounds that stood at a height of 7.6 feet tall. And yes, the Alaskan moose is the largest subspecies of moose, because of their unwieldy sizes. In places like Canada, which, just like with geese, Canada has the largest population of moose. Canada seems to have a certain affinity with animals whose names end in usha. Anyways, when hitting wildlife with a car, it's usually recommended to not swerve to avoid animal, since swerving usually results in far worse outcomes. But when the animal in question is a moose, not swerving is actually considered to be more dangerous. That's just how deadly moose are. One way to deal with a moose collision is to just slam on the gas instead of the brakes and hope that you've went fast enough to knock the moose over your vehicle. If not, then you'll just break their kneecaps, and you'll have almost one ton of muscle collapsing on top of you. Alternatively, you can try to do a more precision-based maneuver, and slam on the brakes before releasing them at the last second so you can lift the front of your car, and effectively shovel the moose and fling it over you. Or you can just swerve to avoid it. And if swerving means colliding into another vehicle, then your best bet is to land a glancing blow on the moose to minimize the impact. Of course, all of these are just recommended ways to avoid a life-threatening collision with a moose. There's no guarantee they will work. 
Since it's a bit hard to actually research the theoretical best way to slam into a moose with a car, with how ridiculous their physical traits are, you would expect moose to have long lifespans. But no, moose live 7 to 12 years on average. It's rare to see a moose live past the age of 20. There are some claims that 25 is the oldest age a moose can reach, but as of date, there have been no recorded instances of a 25 year old moose. Their lifespans seem a bit odd when you consider the fact that most birds can outlive a moose. After all, birds are usually these small, fragile creatures, and yet they're somehow outliving moose. Anyways, capturing a moose and providing it with human care actually ends up reducing its lifespan in most cases. Despite vets being around to provide medical care, moose will actually end up catching diseases way more often. One reason behind the low life expectancy of wild moose is because of a sheer amount of predators preying on calves. Over 50% of moose die as calves. When a moose does grow past being a calf, natural predators become much less of a concern. Despite their large builds, moose are horrible at energy usage efficiency, contributing to their short lifespans, with signs of old age appearing as early as 10 years old. Moose are also fairly susceptible to diseases and parasites, such as brainworms which white-tailed deer are primary hosts to. Brainworms are easily transmitted to moose when white-tailed deer shit the parasites out, transferring them to land snails, and then moose will accidentally eat land snails and bam, brain parasites followed by brain damage or deaths. Another miniature sweat are winter ticks. Due to how large moose are, thousands of these ticks can attach to a single moose and stay there for as long as half a year which, as one would imagine, causes massive amounts of blood loss, severely weakening or even killing the moose. Isn't nature just wonderful? Bouts of clumsiness also contribute to the moose mortality rate, with moose getting into quite a number of accidents such as falling to their deaths or drowning when they're exhausted. But the main cause behind your short life expectancy is once again due to human intervention, with a sizable number of moose dying from hunting or being hit by cars, contributing to over 2,000 moose deaths annually. As climate change continues to run rampant, parasites and diseases become more transmittable. Surprisingly though, moose aren't really diverse when it comes to species. In fact, there's only one species of moose, with the only variation amongst moose being where they live. And even then, they're only classified as subspecies, with there only being 4 to 9 existing subspecies, depending on the criteria used to distinguish subspecies. If you couldn't tell by now, moose are pretty physically gifted. They're great swimmers that can swim at speeds of 6 miles per hour, and can easily swim 10 miles without rest. Just like how fish can swim the instant they hatch, moose are also born with the ability to swim. They can also run up to speeds of 35 miles per hour, with calves being able to outrun a human by the time they're 5 days old. So if you ever find yourself being chased by a moose, just give up and accept your fate. Or you can try to outmaneuver them with quick turns. There's no way you outrun a moose just by running in a straight line. As for telling the difference between a bull and a cow, you can usually do so by looking at their face. Bulls tend to have darker black faces, and cows have lighter brown faces. And if you look closely, you can see that moose have this funky droopy nose, along with a fold of hair covered skin called a dewlap or bell under the chin. It's kind of like the Adam's apple for a moose. A cow's bell looks like a tuft of hair, while bows have larger and rounder bells. Bows were used in bells to mark females where the scent during mating season by rubbing it against them. It's like cuddling, I suppose. But the easiest way by far to differentiate between a bull and a cow is to just check if they have antlers. Cows rarely grow antlers. And speaking of antlers, bulls only have antlers during mating season that they shed and regrow each year. The antlers serve to protect their eyes while fighting another bull for a mate and allows them to show their dominance. Bulls will also piss on their antlers or anywhere else on themselves, because the smell somehow makes the cows horny and increases ovulation or something. I don't know, moose are weird. But anyways, once the mating season is over, bulls no longer need antlers, so just like a used condom, they shed them off in early winter, helping them conserve their energy during the winter by getting rid of unnecessary nutrient usage. When spring comes around, the antler bones start growing inside their skin covering the antler, which is called velvet. Antlers are also one of the fastest growing tissue of any animal, growing up to 8 inches in just 9 days. And as September comes, bulls experience a surge in testosterone and start shedding the velvet, allowing the horns to surface. B 
Between this period of horn growth, you can see an unusual sight of a bald moose, a moose without horns, which I shall now grace you with a picture of. God, just look at it. It's cursed in it. It looks like a fucking donkey. Speaking of which, did you know that moose have also been known to be called rubber-nosed swamp donkeys? What kind of ridiculous name is that? Anyways, moving on. Newborn calves can start developing horn buds sometime in late September. Yearlings might grow spikes or small forks, while the full palm-shaped horn usually begins developing after the age of two. Antler growth usually peaks at the age of five, and is easily the most distinctive feature of bulls, growing up to six and a half feet across. Oh, and mating season or breeding season also begins in late September and lasts until early October. Cows can start getting pregnant at age two, with most having their first calf by the age of three, with the pregnancy period lasting between seven to eight months. Cows usually only have one or two calves, and twins, like in most species, are a rare occurrence. A cow's nutritional condition and body weight limits the number of calves they can have and will continue breeding until their teens. The calves will usually stay with mothers for a year before getting kicked out, so they can be replaced by the next batch of calves. So, if you ever want to be around to witness moose during mating season, then might I recommend that you listen to Green Days "Wake Me Up When September Ends." That way, you can wake up just in the nick of time to watch malicious moose fighting for mates, and perhaps even partake in some moose voyeurism. As for the breeding capabilities of bulls, they can start knocking up cows starting at the age of one. But just like how most preteen boys don't go around fostering children. Most bulls don't tend to start breeding the instant they can. They usually wait until they grow older and stronger, so they can compete with other bulls. Moose are also extremely muscular animals, with especially concentrated masses of muscles around their shoulders, giving them that hump at their neck. Which, funnily enough, the necks of moose are short, kind of like your neck right now, hunched over in that horrible sitting posture of yours. The fur coats of moose consist of hollow hairs that are over half a foot long each. Hollow hairs are a type of hair that's well hollow. The hollowed-out hairs can trap air in them, which provides increased insulation. Come winter, the fur coats of moose will become even denser, forming an impregnable wall of fur. All this fur provides immense amounts of insulation, allowing moose to easily withstand below freezing temperatures. In fact, moose only begin to start feeling the cold when the temperature starts dropping below negative 30 degrees Celsius. When the winter ice melts, moose will start molting and shedding excess fur to cool down, and will spend much of their time swimming around to keep their body temperature down on hot days. And now for the bonus facts that I couldn't find a place to shove them into: moose meat is high in potassium, but still loses to bananas. And speaking of moose meat, a newborn can gain up to 1.5 kilograms a day, which still pales in comparison to the average American. The ears of moose can rotate 180 degrees like an owl's head can, which is a weird feature. And despite moose being walking tanks, their population has been declining once again thanks to human intervention. With the current global population for moose being around 1.5 million, with that number dropping every day. So with that being said, there's not much you can do to save the moose since most of the damage is done by large corporations expanding their businesses. As of now, the moose population is predicted to completely disappear in about 50 years at the current rate of decline. The prediction isn't a guarantee since it's based purely off of speculation, but supposed experts are claiming that it's the work of parasites, which I suppose isn't entirely wrong since humans are technically the biggest parasites. But anyways, save the moose or don't. Either way, it doesn't really concern me. I've never actually seen a moose in person.